So we'll devote a whole little lecture to this important aspect of communities, diversity. The, as far as species go, the community attributes that concern species are composition, patterns, and diversity. Species in a community may be characteristic, always found, or accidental, occurring now and then. Some species are ubiquitous. They're not only found in this community, but in many others. And we can also compare species on their relative importance, usually determined by the abundance or cover of individuals of that species. There are different kinds of patterns we can look at the spatial and temporal patterns of species. They may become dominant or less important at different times. And how big the niche breadth of species are and if those niches overlap. And lastly, diversity, the three properties, richness, evenness, and overall diversity made up by richness and evenness we can compare within and between stands. Let's focus on diversity. What we often think of as species diversity is the simple number of species in a given area, but that is technically defined as species richness, the number of species per area. Another important aspect of true diversity is evenness or equitability, how the individuals in that community are distributed among the species present. So species diversity is actually species richness weighted by evenness. So richness, the number of species, does not truly equal diversity because you could have, for example, fewer species present but a more diverse community. And let's look at how that might be. Let's look at this example from a textbook. Two communities with the same number of species present. If you look, you can see the daisy, the tulip, the bush, and the grass. And so in both communities, we have the daisy, the tulip, the bush, and the grass. But what differs is the number of individuals of each species present. So for community A, things are quite even because you have three tulips, three daisies, three bushes, and three grasses. And that's different than community B, where we have one daisy, two tulips, a single bush, and a whole bunch of grasses. So you can ask, which is the more diverse community? If it's the number of species weighted by evenness, the more even the distribution of species, the more diverse. I guess one way of thinking of it is what is the chance of a single individual being next to another individual of its same species? If that probability is high, then there's, it's probably less evenly distributed. Like here, many grasses are next to other grasses. Whereas here, most things are next to something else. So in this case, community A is more diverse, ha is, has greater evenness and is more diverse than community B, which has the same number of species but much less even. In general, the bigger the area, the greater the number of species. And as you sample one area, your sample keeps continuing to increase as you discover more species then levels off. That's called the species area curve. But in these examples are some different, two different places, the lower graph Malaysia, the upper graph the West Indies, different organisms, birds at the bottom, amphibians and reptiles at the top. And across the bottom, the area of the islands 
measured. And in both cases, the larger the island, the more species of whatever kind of organism they were studying were present. So remembering that true diversity is species richness weighted by evenness, ecologists have come up with a variety of indices of diversity. There's many to choose from. Some of my favorites are here, Simpson's D, which is equal to 1 minus the sum of the proportions of all the species squared. And that value, D value, is between 0 and 1. Shannon Wiener H is the sum of the proportions of every species summed times the natural log of their proportion. And that ranges from 0 to 7. With all of these, the larger number means the more diverse. And then there's one e to the h, which is both proportional to the number of species and Simpson's index. So in this table, those three diversity indices over on the right are shown for several or five different sample populations. In the first line, the species are A through E. All of the species are present in the same proportion. So they're maximally, this, this community has maximum evenness. And you can see the diversity, Simpson's D, is the highest number there, 5. The next community has only four of the species present, also in equal proportions, but that's somewhat lower. The next, there are four species present and one much less abundant. So that increases a little higher than 4.0. And that difference is exaggerated here with the fourth species present very small proportion. So that's slightly less than this one, but still more than 4.0. And in the last one, we see one species, half of the individuals, the other one a third, and then the others in lower proportions, much less even, and the diversity measured by D is smaller. In these other cases, we see the same pattern of H going down and then increasing a little going down again, and E to the H also. As one travels the surface of the Earth, there are some generalizations we can make. That's, there's increasing species richness as well as species diversity as you go from the poles to the equator and from high to low elevations as well. Let me draw a hill and we'll say from high elevations to low elevations. There's been a lot of talk in ecology about whether or not having more species present and more equitable distribution of individuals among the species makes a community more stable or less stable. This is because food web structure influences community stability. And stability has two components, resistance and resilience. Sometimes resistance is called constancy and resilience, the ability of a community to bounce back if disturbed. Diversity, having a greater number of species, makes communities more resilient, able to recover from a disturbance. So here's an example of microorganisms in a lab. If species diversity increases from low to high, resilience um, increases also. The difference is especially obvious, the pattern or trend is especially obvious in situations of low productivity. In higher productivity, not quite so great. And we know from our earlier study of species interactions, competition, and so on, that predators feeding on the lower trophic levels 
can influence diversity at those trophic levels. Remember the experiments in which Robert Payne excluded sea stars from invertebrates in the rocky intertidal with the starfish gone, one species was able to outcompete and take over, whereas when starfish were present, there were more species, more prey species present. This particular picture here shows the web-like nature where you may have some prey feeding on others and so on. There have been some very creative experiments that have been done, some of them involving vegetation change in plant communities by eliminating predators have been studied using insecticides. And this young man or woman here is standing between two treatment fields. The one on the left is the control with a number of different species present. The one on the right, a field treated by insecticides. And what you can see is without the insect herbivores, in general, the plants are taller but what I think you can also see is that the yellow-flowered goldenrod is much more abundant when not kept in check by its predators, its herbivores, I should say, and takes over, and there's less diversity. So the idea of trophic cascades is very interesting and important in community ecology. A lot of people, animal-biased, think Things are controlled only in a top-down way, with the predators controlling the lower trophic levels by their consumption. And you can see the differences in these patterns. And what a trophic cascade is, in my opinion, is an alternation of the relative sizes of trophic levels. And we usually see this with top-down effects. So let's look at the trophic pyramid starting at the left with the producer, the herbivores, shown by this circle here of a certain size, the primary consumers eat them, and they're present, this biomass, and the secondary consumers, the next biomass, smaller and smaller. We know really this might be at about 10%, but these are shown in this size so we can see them. So if more plants are produced. This is a bottom-up effect of increased production. Everything else increases also. More plants can support more herbivores and this in turn can produce, uh, can support more predators on those herbivores. If something happens to increase the predators that are eating the herbivores, then that number gets smaller and it releases the plants and so this gets bigger. And so these are alternating effects. If a tertiary consumer comes in and eats this predator, the numbers decrease, releasing this level to increase, and with more of these, the producers decrease. So here's a diagram to the left showing this food web, trophic um, pyramid, with fish at the top controlling the density of their zooplankton prey. Those zooplankton in turn eat the algae so when zooplankton are fewer, algae and flagellate producers increase in response to more nutrient input. In these trophic pyramids, the more species richness there is, the greater the food web complexity. If there's only a few species, the interactions are more direct. The more species there are, the more interactions you can have within each trophic level as well as between trophic levels. So in this example, looking at the invertebrates that live inside the pitcher plant leaves of pitcher plants in 
the Old World Tropics, Madagascar, Malaysia, and the Seychelles. Seychelles being islands have fewer species and things are a little more simple with five species. Only two guilds, six links, which are who eats whom, and on average the number of links per species, three. In Madagascar, slightly bigger, eight species, four guilds, and um, more links. And then in Malaysia, two parts looked at here, many more species, even more guilds, twice the number of links, and more links per species. Now we did look at interactions in a number of ways using the loop diagrams and the arrows and the negative um, circles, etc. People draw diagrams in all different ways, but I love this example of a trophic cascade with fish having potential beneficial effects on pollinators. And how could that possibly be? The fish jumping out of the water, licking nectar from a flower? No. Not only do the nutrients fish put into the water trickle up and enhance productivity of the plant, but the fish eat the larval dragonflies and in doing so decrease their numbers. Oops. And then with fewer dragonflies, more pollinators. So that's how fish can benefit the pollinators. And the more pollinators, the more pollination. And that benefits the plants too.